And I know a lot about Shopify, but like that was literally the single best summary of the state of Shopify right now. I couldn't imagine trying to start Shopify without Welcome back to another exciting video. We have Dan De Silva, the man, the myth, the legend here with us. Um, if you guys don't know Dan, um, he's another large YouTuber, um, has a massive Shopify following, and is also just one of my best friends. Aww. We're gonna be talking about the state of drop shipping, the state of Shopify, right? Because a lot of things have changed. Three to five years ago, you could just find any necklace on AliExpress and become Literally. an instant bazillionaire, right? We're gonna be answering the age old question since the dawn of time, which is, is Shopify, is drop shipping saturated? Um, and if it is, right, is it even still possible to make money? So we're gonna be answering those two questions. Um, really quickly though, Dan, give us like a 60 second background. So quick backstory, uh, I don't wanna spend too much time on it. I owed my parents a lot of money, didn't know where to go. Uh, I, I had no college degree, I was a high school dropout. I was, uh, I was literally a loser, um, and it, it, I, that's how I look at my old self. And I ended up finding through trial and error drop shipping and oh man, let me just tell you, it's been such a fun ride. Millions of dollars generated um, just through personally with me and partners as well. Right. So that's kind of how I got started was out of pure desperation of needing to pay our parents back. Cool, so that was like the 15 second story. So let's get right into it. So the market a few years ago, here's the thing really quickly before I dive into the market a few years ago, it's not so much the market has changed, the consumer has changed. So the market a few years ago, you can just throw up anything on Facebook and legitimately anything <laughs> and make disgusting amounts of money. Because here's the thing, the CPMs back then, so how much you pay for every 1,000 impressions on a platform like Facebook was dirt cheap. And when I first got started, Facebook didn't even have 2 million advertisers on the advertisement platform. Now there's over 6 million advertisers so there wasn't as much competition back then and you can literally just throw up and, and I keep saying anything because I would try the most random things and if I were to try them today it would just fail completely but yeah. back then I would just throw up a bunch of different things on a completely generic store and just start advertising it would sell like crazy just go go and the very first product that I uh, that I had a home run with um, we ended up doing around 250k of sales worth of sales of that one particular product what was it uh, all right, so I didn't know about infringement back when I first started. This was my very first month, so cut me some slack, okay? Right. It was a Canon mug. Okay. Like, you know, like a lens mug <laughs> thing? Yeah. So I ended up start. I started off with that, but again, hopefully Canon doesn't come after me now and be like, yeah, we, <laughs> we know what you did. So, um, so, and again, I never did it ever again. Once I realized that, holy cow, I could turn this into a really big business. That's when I learned about, you know, EINs and setting myself up properly, getting lawyers involved, and they were like, you can't sell that. I'm like, oh, why? And then they told me, I was like, oh, I had no idea. Um, so that was the, that was the very first problem. Product. Where everything, where everything just blew up was fidget spinners. Um, yeah, when when like the gold and chrome ones came out and like the different styles, dude, I couldn't I couldn't stop selling those if I tried. Now, everything's different. Everything is completely different now. Consumers have evolved. You have to understand back back then, Facebook is interruption based marketing. So essentially, you are interrupting somebody's pattern. Think of Facebook as like. Just you and me hanging out over here and some random person walking in and be like, hey, I have this product, you want it? And then if we just don't say anything for three seconds, they just go they go away to somebody else's house and walk in and be like, hey, I have this product, you want it? It's, uh, it's very awkward and that's what Facebook is. Now, if he goes around to 100 different houses, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure maybe one or two people will be like, yeah, we're interested. That's essentially what Facebook is. We are interrupting people when they're trying to look at Aunt Sally's, you know, Pictures of her picnic or something. Yeah. yeah. So that's essentially what we're doing. And back then, it was like a, it was like a, like a, a looked upon, like not, not negatively looked upon now, because ads aren't negatively looked upon, but they are, they're more interruption based. People get angry with them. That's why they have negative and positive feedback score with, with Facebook now. And back then, we were, we would advertise, and people would just click. They'd be like, oh, that's perfect. They just click, and they'd go ahead and purchase. Now. People have to see the ad and then they have to re-see it like four or five times before they decide, hey, I will purchase it. So the frequency of the end user purchasing and how many times they have to see your particular advertisement from then and now has increased. 
So if you take a look at some of the most successful stores out right now, aside from like the celebrity stores, it's, um, you know, you, you kind of have to understand that the market is really catering to branded products, like certain ty- certain style branded products. Like one that I sold recently was a blender, right? A portable blender that has, you know, the thing inside and charged with the USB. But then you have a site like blendjet.com where it only has that one product. That's That's the only thing they sell and they are crushing it. They are making so much money and it's only from one product. <clears throat> now, where the differentiating factor becomes is how do you find that product? How do you, how do you have to create a bunch of one product stores and hope one of them hits? No, and this is kind of where things get a little bit more tactical. What I do right now is I own the fancygadget.com and if you go on there, there's over 200 different little gadget-based products. And um, what I do is I just start creating a bunch of ads, running five to $10 every single day for the ad set. And I just start running it to those particular products and, and I wanna see what works. So I'll be testing like 80, 90 things at any given time, just to be, you know, not because I want to, but more so because I can. I Once I started making enough money, I grew my budget even further and I didn't only have to test one, two, three products. I can go out and just mass test, find out what works and then take them to their own stores. So how are you finding these these gadgets? Because I've always heard that gadgets, right, are, are really working very well for people. It makes a lot of sense too, because you can't go and buy like a blender bottle right. from like Safeway or Walmart. The very first thing that I would say is use something like Thieve.co. And all Thieve is, is a compilation of AliExpress uh, products that are, that are really trendy, really cool, and it's consumer driven. So consumers, uh, they have like a little plugin for Google Chrome, and when people buy stuff from AliExpress, they put it into like the Thieve database, and it shows you like how many sales of regular consumers, not drop shippers. Wow. So it tells us what consumers are buying, which is the first thing. The second thing that I do is I'll just scour all, like AliExpress all day and night long and just all I'll do is I'll go in and start looking at the related products and I'll also dive into the vendor's store. So I'll see who's selling it, go to the vendor and look at their other top sellers, like their best sellers. Because typically if I'm looking for like a, like an iPhone charger, wireless iPhone charger, I can go and find one of the top vendors, go into his store and then his top sellers will be the same exact product just in different styles and variations. And then the third thing, which is, it, this is more the advanced, but this is where people should end up, is with an agent in China. So it's called a dropship agent. What, they have multiple different roles, but one role you could assign to them is going to these trade shows, going to these manufacturers, and asking them what's new and coming out, and then these dropship agents, will they'll text you, typically through WeChat, and they'll send you pictures of what's new, like of the actual product, and then you have first dibs of those, which is really cool before they hit AliExpress. Because there's a big misconception that AliExpress is the manufacturer. No, AliExpress is a supplier. Right. So a supplier still needs to go to the manufacturer. All AliExpress is is suppliers. They go to the manufacturer, they buy a bunch of products. That's why if you ever look at an AliExpress vendor, like if you go to their vendor page, they all have the same related product. They're not like the Walmart of AliExpress, one particular vendor. It's is because they go to a manufacturer who specializes in electronics and they'll buy in bulk and it might be like 10 cents for a unit and they'll sell it for 20 cents but they're playing so much volume that we're able to buy it for 20 cents and still sell it at a profit but what a dropship agent does is they'll go right to the manufacturer is it dead absolutely not uh, drop shipping has been around way before I was born and it will be around way after I'm gone so drop shipping is very far from dead but like I said in the beginning People think it's dead because it's not as easy as it was to make sales. Right. It's because more so not the market, but the consumer is changing. The consumers are always changing on how they enjoy purchasing and the purchasing experience. Before it used to be one touch, right? One or two touches to go ahead of them seeing an ad and buying. Now it might require five to eight which again, makes it more expensive for the advertisers like us. So even though we know it requires a little bit more time for the user to see the ad before they purchase, now how do we evolve with that, right? Okay, so it might be more expensive, so that means what, we have to operate in the red? No, that means we have to start building out and using different processes, perhaps maybe post-sale sequences, where if somebody purchases something from your store, they're gonna get follow-up emails with a bunch of different products that are related to what they purchased. Um, Card abandonment, you have upsell apps, you have retargeting post-sale sequences. If somebody purchases from you and they're, they're a buyer, you can put them into their own little database and show them different ads. So that's how you have to evolve. So essentially, even if it looks like you're taking a loss on the very front end of the sale, you're still making all the money in the back. Just like any other business, you're required to have capital, okay? Now, 
the lowest amount now in 2019 that I would suggest anybody to start with is around seven to eight hundred dollars bare minimum to get, to get started with. If you asked me two years ago, I would have said, yeah, you could get started with like 200, 300 bucks, but the market moves, so now you need a little bit more capital. If you don't have seven to eight hundred dollars to really get started, what I suggest doing is finding the means and even go through some of Kevin's videos, he'll show you a bunch of different strategies that you can use to make that money. Go ahead, save up, and then literally dive in and start making money with the business. Now, if you have like two, 3,000, you're good to go. You'll find, you'll find a product that is a winner yeah. and you're, you'll be able to scale that up. And the second problem that is gonna occur if you have like two, 3,000 is um, once you find that winner, you're gonna have to figure out a way to get more money to keep on scaling that product. That's, that's a good problem, a quote unquote good problem to have. Yeah. So if you have you know, a product that's doing really well, you only have $3,000, but after $3,000, you, you made like eight, $9,000, you're like, oh my goodness, where can I get more money to keep spending? Yeah. And then you're gonna, obviously the smart way would be to you know, uh, maybe take out a loan, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah. And you can get started with 0% APR credit cards. Remember, right. like I got, started with, I got started with credit cards for Amazon FBA. Mm -hmm. I, I borrowed $6,100. Um, I made that money back in a week after I started selling, right? And we made tons and tons more than that, reinvested it all into our business and just continue to grow it larger and larger and larger. So again, guys, Dan Da Silva, make sure you go and subscribe to his channel, turn on notifications. And if you wanna learn the best way to actually find viral products, then what you need to do right here is check out this video right here on Shopify product research where we break down the best ways to do product research and find viral products. So Dan, thanks again and we'll see you guys soon. What is up ninjas? Today I'm gonna reveal for the very first time ever one of my absolute favorite, most top secret coveted product research strategies on Shopify.